Um, it's, it's indeed <clears throat> pleasure to be here. I'm sorry that I couldn't be here yesterday, but I'm here today, and I changed the talk a little bit, um, being at the very end, because I, I'm talking with Paul, the important issue is sort of taking the longer view, and I think, you know, Ed expressed a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. In fact, probably the most enthusiasm I've heard from Ed, knowing him for a long time, for something he wasn't involved in, and, it was, uh, and I think that's a great compliment to this whole structure, and it's Certainly a pleasure to be here, and uh, we at the NCI have looked very closely at the mutograph, and certainly, uh, you know, um, imitation is the highest form of flattery in being able to develop a project such as you heard about Sherlock Lung and others to come. So let me start with the art side. So what do these artistic moments that I'm going to put up there have? These are favorite things of mine. Give me one minute of this, and the talk will bring different strands of this. One is... I have to say, all my European friends always say the Americans don't know how to play football. Well, what <laughs> happened on Sunday? Uh, the fourth time the American women won the World Cup, and they played with great style in the lawn. And I just think in this age, you know, it's not a male-dominated sport anymore. I think the Americans understand a lot about football, and we're very proud of that, and it's a very international activity. But I just need to say teamwork is everything. That was won not by one player, but by a full team. And I think to get where we want to go, it's got to be a team of everybody, not nation against nation. The second is imagery and symbolism. What is this, what do we see? Is it, can we make sense of it? Very often, we can't make sense. We have plenty of signatures. We don't know what they mean. We can't put them together. And more importantly, we are pulling them apart as the very elegant biochemistry and carcinogenesis models get put in place. So we have to be quite aware of what we're doing. The next is that we will always find the unexpected. My favorite modern writer, Marcel Proust, who said, you know, the different ways always come together in ways in which you don't understand and you don't expect. The unexpected comes out of that. At the same time, Charles Dickens said a tale of two cities. There are the good times and bad times. And I would say the good times are always the germline as a germline geneticist. We forget about that. This group forgets about that. Uh, and it's when the germline has gone bad. That's what cancer is about. And I think that balance is a very important issue that we have to remember. There is elegance in nature and crafting nature. We're trying to craft a model and understand. And Paul and others know in my office and at home, I have many bonsai trees and find this an extraordinarily attractive way of looking at things. But most of all, uh, I was trained as a musician before I went to medical school. The, the marriage of science and art are best in music, in my mind. If you look at the contrapuntal studies of Johann Sebastian Bach and the Art of the Fugue, it's the most remarkable work that scientifically makes sense, but intellectually it does, but artistically it takes you to another world. So I think these are the kinds of things that we have to dream big in looking at things like the mutograph and other kinds of studies. So I, you know, I use Google like everyone else, and I ask the question, well, what is the mutograph? Well, we know about the grand challenge. We've seen this slide and talked about it. I did a little homework. What was the original mutograph? Well, in 1897, a German person imitated what the Lumiere brothers did down the street, and that was coming up with a movie camera. And the reason I want to use the movie camera is that a movie camera has a critical element that we have the hardest time with within the mutograph. That's time. What happens to something over time? We are really forensic pathologists looking at a mess of tissue at one time. But the question is, how did it get there? We can infer with high-definition sequencing and clonal evolution and all these wonderful tools, but we still don't really fully understand the sequence of those events. And I think a study like the mutograph is able to begin to get in that direction and certainly looking at normal tissue. But I, I, I think that, you know, it's, it, it, to me it's very humorous that, you know, mutograph was an imitation, a German imitation of what the French had done. And they actually, the first movie was just the workers leaving the factory down the street from here, which is, you know, maybe what, 500 meters from here. So it's very appropriate that we're coming to truth down here at IARC, a little bit separate from um, um, where that had taken place. So I think the science of mutational signatures really is focused on somatic events that are post zygotic. And I really want to emphasize this post zygotic, okay? One of the things that has not come up today, and I don't think it probably came up yesterday, are embryonic, things that are going on in very early gestation. And that, that's where the mutograph, I think, needs to think going backwards in time, where and how 
genomes are more or less susceptible. And for instance, trained as a pediatric oncologist, the question of pediatric cancers, how and why they form. I think that's, a, 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 to me, a developmentally and scientifically very intellectually important thing. And we're looking at primarily adult cancers. Once you're past adolescence, you're over the hump. Life's all downhill at that point. You're only falling apart. You're not getting better. Uh, you know, it's, you may be wiser, but uh, your body is not wiser at that point. So I think, you know, we need to address these kinds of questions. And the first is, what is the precision of our mutational signature detection? And you sort of see we're pulling it apart further and further, which is a good thing to do. And what do they tell us about etiology? A tremendous amount. We can go forwards for clinical implications, and we are trying our hardest to go backwards. But really, what is that underlying biology of the mutational signatures, that yin and yang of generation and repair errors? And how do these signatures inform our understanding of the cancer drivers? They're not the same things. And there's a selection, and there's a selection bias, and this is where time is probably the thing that we really understand the least, how we put together these particular models. Can we relate them to outcomes? I think so, but with a higher standard than we are applying for the discovery. And can they be used for precision oncology with an even higher standard? And I'll come back to that. So these are sort of the themes I want to do. So the etiology of cancer. Joe Framani once said that years ago in joking, and then he actually wrote this in a piece, cancer is 100% genetics and 100% environmental, i.e., it's that interaction between how your genome set your ability to respond or not to respond or to be susceptible or not susceptible to the kinds of carcinogens and activities that are going on in your body. So we know all about these environmental and lifestyle, and we know a lot about genetic susceptibility. And these are the choices that we make, and these are the set points that we're born with, but there's also chance. And that chance, you know, are we, are we narrowing the fraction of what we would call chance, yes, but by how much? By being able to define each of those other two sides. And I think the mutograph particularly is marvelous for the left side, but I don't want to forget the germline, the good times and the bad times, okay? The tale of two cities, you know, the germline is a very important thing. We live with that. We are dependent on that. If you didn't have a germline, you'd be in a lot of trouble. Okay? We take that for granted and in our analyses. I'm, I worry, you know, have my time with the TCGA was always a little bit unpopular because I kept trying to remind them, well, how and why are you seeing these things in relationship to the germline as opposed to them being, you know, organisms all unto themselves, i.e. cancer somatic genomes. Well, most cancer is driven, not caused, by many environmental exposures. And I think that's an important discussion, happy to have afterwards at the bar and the cafe. We've talked a lot about exposures, tobacco, viruses, aflatoxin, radiation, variation, and secular trends in fixed populations. But more importantly, I think what we are starting to really see are ways to get at understanding the more than 85 single base signatures, some of which we know are due to the artifacts of just uh, short read. And now when PacBio comes online and we have genomes with PacBio, it will be very interesting to see what those particular biases are and how they may correct some of these or allow us to better accommodate the data that we have. But again, I want to say that germline is very important, particularly when we have these conversations of APOBEC. There are those people who are looking at the APOBEC clusters on different chromosomes and seeing marked difference in how the germline is influencing the kinds of events and the frequency of the events in response to particular uh, triggers, both in, in models, but more importantly in diseases like bladder cancer and being able to really separate those. So I, again, come back to that point. So the hard work ahead is linking the exposure to the tumor mutational signatures. And I think consortial activities have to be advanced. So the mutograph is a wonderful place to start. The NCI has put Sherlock Lung on the table, talking about other Sherlock's in other places. And we certainly hope that other funding agencies and other groups will see large and small approaches. I personally think pediatrics needs to be a big part of this, because I think it's such an interesting question of how and why Wilms tumor, how and why osteosarcoma, brain tumors, leukemia, really get at some of these fundamental things in very fast-moving activities that have very few drivers, per se. So it really is a critical issue. There's a need for a much higher quality exposure assessment. We talk about the exposome, but it's still a very vague and naive concept. I mean, we have a few things to go with that, but we don't capture our exposures very well. 
The same carcinogens may come from multiple sources, which make the signature mapping that much more difficult. And multiple carcinogens may act through common pathways. So again, I'm always worried to say that this is the aflatoxin signature. Aflatoxin may be important for a given signature, but there are other things can perhaps also get you to that point through similar or different mechanisms. And it really is a call to go deeper. We could easily say, let's take all our time and do everything and have the clinical implications. But I think we'll go slower if we don't take and also, in parallel, have to have part of that portfolio focused on the fundamental understanding of carcinogenesis, that interaction of the environment or exposures and DNA errors and RNA errors, okay? Uh, those are each key things and how the adducts, like that, that was a very elegant talk uh, just before, Ed, you know, really getting it mechanistically, how and what way do we really see those relationships unfold before us. Exposure, exposure interactions are things we have to worry about. In the unclassified mutational signatures, the so-called Donald Rumsfeld unknown unknowns are going to be there. You know, we have to keep lowering, you know, and, and closing in. But I think the importance of linking the epidemiologic with experimental models can be very informative. And I think, you know, this recent paper in Cell, I know there's lots of criticism to certain aspects, but this really lays down, I think, a very fundamental principle that we have to continue. And our colleagues who do the animal models and in vitro models and organites, I think, are absolutely fantastic. And they, they are absolutely critical to be able to have this be useful and applicable information. So we work backwards and we have these big projects like the mutographs and Sherlock Lung, and we're very excited to see those. But we also have many promising opportunities born of clever clinical or epidemiologic design. There are too many to name. Uh, we have compelling opportunities to integrate laboratory. There's not enough. Public health insights, such as with radiation and industrial. And we have a whole other aspect that I don't think has really been touched. It's a forensic. So the United States, the most litigious country, now has a whole series of epidemiologic associations that have landed in the courts and saying that if somebody has exposure to talc powder and they develop ovarian cancer, large settlement, glyphosate and NHL, legal settlement. So in the United States now, there's a lot of interest, and there are people actually starting to ask about this. Are there ways that we could look at the tumors of individuals who are alleging this and use molecular or mutational signatures to be able to forensically make a call and what would that threshold be? And so this becomes all the more worrisome. And we have to realize that all this exciting science has some of these very, very daunting downstream challenges in front of us that frankly worry me a lot, to, you know, to be called, Dr. You know, Andrew Puff, we, you know, would you please comment on this, Dr. Smith, on this? I mean, I think it's really going to be something. So I'm just going to give two very brief examples, something that we've been very committed to for a long time in our program, which is looking at low-dose radiation in, the, for instance, the Chernobyl studies. We have a major investment of the NCI. And we've now sequenced about almost uh, 400 cases of thyroid cancer from young adults and children after the Chernobyl accident in the Ukraine. And we can clearly see that there are minor increases in indels. Uh, STRs are not significantly affected. Structural variation is too unstable. And we know that in radiogenomics, whole chromosome events or dicentric nuclei have been sort of the, the, the industry standards. We, what I didn't show up here is it turns out that over 94% over of the tumors have a RAS-related event, either that they have uh, a BRAF mutation, an HRAS mutation, or a fusion that involves a RAS pathway gene. So thyroid cancer is a very interesting cancer, and it's very restricted in where we see the functional activities taking place. Um, we know there's quite a bit. There's a very elegant paper from the, um, from the Sanger Group looking at mutational signatures, people who got high doses and of, of therapeutic radiation with increased deletions and, and junction microhomology. Very interesting. But for the low dose, Interestingly enough, when we went to, into the Chernobyl study, we've done extensive sequencing, and the Broad has been a big part of this. We have normal tissue that's irradiated as well as blood in a high fraction, so we have a sort of a three-part analysis that we are now con concluding, plus 70 children with no exposure from other parts of the country at the same time, so asking the background question of an epidemiologic design. And what's interesting is we see Signature 5 completely dominating, okay? we don't see a new signature that's above about 2%. And so a good fraction of these kids have 
uh, or young adults have received pretty substantial amounts of radiation, not quite at the level that you saw in the previous paper from the Sanger looking at, you know, individuals who got therapeutic radiation. But we were, were kind of surprised by this. And, you know, we, and Jagel and others have spent quite a bit of time trying to pull this apart, and we can't really find an SNV signature, you know. There may be uh, an ID signature, but that's the hardest to identify at this point. And so, you know, we're moving ahead on that. Now, I'm going to switch to the confessions of an armchair mutational signature chaser. So this issue of talc and ovarian cancer has been very troubling in the United States because the epidemiologic data, I'm, I won't lose my job and I'll be criticized for this, is really weak at best. And the courts have felt otherwise. But I think there is some mechanistic information that's of interest, but the epidemiologic is clearly not there. So I uh, initiated a, a project. I asked Ludmill to look at what we could see in the ovarian world, the 454 whole exomes and 135 whole genomes, and ask this question, do we see a unique signature in ovarian cancer for one? Um, it's hard to say because the asbestos is supposedly what is, you know, um, is, you know, been seen as a contaminant in the talc powder. If you go to the mesothelioma data, they're very, very quiet genomes, very quiet, so quiet, like some of the pediatric ones, that the ability to find signatures is going to be extremely difficult. It appears that just a handful of events drive you. Not quite as bare as retinoblastoma, but like some of the pediatric solid tumors. So uh, I'm, going to, I'm speaking on behalf of Ludmill, who kindly sent this to me very recently that 98% of the signatures can be explained by known cancer-related signatures plus sequencing artifacts. Uh, and when you look at the ID signatures are explained, the 3% are within the error of what we expect, so it's not as if there's a smoking gun that we've missed. And of the 96% DBS ones that are unknown, they are shared with all the other cancers, so there's nothing that jumped off the page saying we would have a molecular signature that could address the legal question of should someone be considered to have, you know, a decision made in their favor on the basis of exposure to talc and or asbestos. But this is the kind of question I think that's going to come down the line to us as we create more of these data sets and have these findings with exposures, whether they're industrial or radiation, infection and the like. And it's just, uh, I think it's our future reality. So if talc or asbestos is leaving a mark, it will be a, in a tiny fraction yet to be determined. One could say we need to do this at 10x that size and over time we will revisit this with much larger sets of ovarian cancer, but at the moment we just don't see that. So must the precision of immutational signature detection be comparable for discovery in clinical application? I'd say no, no, no. Okay, and I'm going to tell you why. Because I think the standards for discoveries we've learned it's in the history of genetics is we we always insist on validation and replication. We can live with false positives, whether it's in genome-wide association studies or linkage studies, but over time, when we accumulate enough evidence, we either see that some stand up to the test of time and others don't. So that's a very different standard than I think, you know, than when we're looking at clinical decisions to be precise and accurate. It's really, is it when in, when and how is it defensible to have these standards be achieved with clear evidence of what the errors and what the uncertainties are? Because really, the prospective decisions for therapy or surgery matter only to the case at hand. And it's a, a fundamental, uh, I think, pact that the physician or the care provider has that they have the best evidence to say this makes sense to do that. There's no correction post hoc if you've gone and done body altering surgery on someone with BRCA ness and it turns out that it's not an accurate assessment per se. So I think we have to think as we move towards some consortium, some of the last points that I may want to make about putting these in, in that context. And we must be wary of the innumerable case reports. The fact that we see these things often in very extenuating situations of multiple relapses and we're into the world that Eric Topol likes to talk about with N of ones. And I think for clinical medicine, that's a very dangerous thing. And, and we as a community have to guard against that to have this information be misused. It will be, but we have to minimize that. Again, that's one of the more sobering aspects. So we know that mutational signatures, as Will and others have talked about, 
is an emerging concept that can help to identify hereditary cancers and take that set of roughly 10% of the sporadic cancers that harbor a known pathogenic mutation. We see that from TCGA, we see that from the pediatric cancers, we see that from ICGCA, I ICGC, and it's very interesting. Uh, but when you look at the specific cancers, it can vary. We, I'm not showing the data here, but for pediatric osteosarcoma, more than a quarter of the children and young adults have a pathogenic mutation, whereas you go to Ewing sarcoma, a similar tumor, and it's less than 3%. So we, we know that the genetic architectures, the susceptibility, are very different. And this has very important implications for thinking about how and why we would use Brachinus to be able to give someone a PARP inhibitor. We do that in extenuating circumstances, but prospectively, are we going to change primary breast cancer therapy on the basis of mutational signatures? If we're going to do that, we have to standardize that, and we're far away from doing that. We have exciting data to talk about it, but we have to design those studies, and the clinical trials network has to be a big part of that, including can we use FFPE with all of its artifacts potentially getting in the way, and fresh frozen. Um, and the supplemental value of therapeutic targets derived from germline analysis, really, you can't replace that. It's ideal to use them together, is my mind. You want to do that, you do the brachinus, and then you're going to search through the germline and see what you get. So this is thanks to discussions with Will and Paz in the past, and uh, really, you know, when breast cancer, we know about about 25 genes, we know about BRCA, we know about the HRD errors and the HRD signatures, but is that enough to be able to make clinical decisions? And I think right now we may, it may be helpful for ruling out benign disease where there are circumstances where we may not choose to go forward and treat, but even that needs to be tested, I think, very, very carefully. But it's a, a very arresting concept. So we know, as Peter pointed out, that postzygotic mutations are everywhere. Very elegant studies coming out of the Sanger and now from Japan, finding somatic mutations in every tissue. And Gaddy Getz in GTEx has done this very, very thoroughly with 26 different uh, uh, body parts being analyzed. And we, we have to have this map because if we're going to be really talking about drivers, we have to understand drivers contextually, not as a singular frequentist observation. And we know that they're much higher than expected. So like in esophageal cancer, it really blows my mind, pardon the expression, but to see that 75% of normal esophages have a notch one mutation that would be a driver gene. But for esophageal, um, you know, um, and esophageal squamous carcinoma is one in 125 individuals in the UK. So the microenvironment, there are other things that are part of that picture. And I think that's where time and space are each very important. We know that detectable clonal mosaicism is all over there for predicting hematopoietic diseases. It's a marker of genetic integrity. We've spent a lot of time looking at why mosaicism, which I'm sorry to say to all the men in this room who are 40 and over, only goes with time. I mean, there'll be 50 to 60 percent of you will lose a good fraction of your Y chromosomes over the next uh, 20 years if you're over 40 years of age. UK Biobank with 200,000 men have shown us that when you start mapping that by age. And smoking also has a very profound effect on the loss of that. So it's telling us that the genomic integrity has environmental as well as germline drivers, okay? Uh, and we can see the spectrum of single base all the way to large structural things that we used to call cancer. Uh, and you can see the mosaicism in the, in the UK biobank and seeing those who are current, former, and never smokers, those curves shift on the basis of tobacco exposure and age alone. Really quite striking. So I think this is sort of one of the last concepts that I want to put out there, the notion of the interactions between our environmental exposures and the germline and the somatically acquired, it's really a three or four dimensional problem. And what are these dynamics and how they change? That's what I see Mutograph 2 is going to have to address. And how do we understand the microenvironment over time? So the burning questions that I would put in front of you all are, what are the optimal algorithms to define somatic signatures? What are the boundaries for analysis? Discovery are different than clinical utility. Density of mutational events, that's very important. Read coverage and read length. And I think Illumina versus PacBio, we're going to have to revisit this when we have a lot of PacBio data out there, and certainly Oxford Nanopore or whoever comes along, Ion Torrent and puts us there. The source of the, t of the materials, you know, pathologically we have such a plethora of FFPE, but very little fresh frozen. 
So our clinical world is going to be driven at least in part by the discovery in FFPE and we have to account for that appropriately. What are those endogenous events, the tissue specific differences in rates, that comes back to the post-zygotic uh, somatic mutations, and then the mutational timing, clonal events. We clearly know that clonality is very important and you know, it may not be a continuous process. Some may come do their harm and go away over a period of time. And so uh, sampling is going to be critical. And I think for this, model systems are absolutely essential. The basic biology has to be done to understand and to be able to apply these questions, particularly if we want to have any impact on precision oncology or precision prevention oncology, which is what the sort of the promissory note floated by the epidemiologist has always been. So the benchmarking of signatures, this is something we've been talking about at the NCI, how to look at the 19 algorithms. And so we're, I think, pretty much converging on this. I've been talking quite a bit with Doug Lowy and some with Lou Stout, a little bit with Ed Harlow, of trying to have a competition where in a space, in a cloud space where the analysis is brought to the data as opposed to the data going to private sector places that everyone would be able to see the performance and compare those and have the metrics for whole genome, whole exome and targeted. Again, this very fundamental question of what are you looking at and how much of the genome are there biases, you know, are there differences between looking at a whole exome that's 2% of the genome but is that the appropriate 2% if you're looking at background or selected events and this question of selection versus non-selection remains a profoundly important question that I think we underestimate. And this gets at the clinical question of the intolerance of false negatives. This would be done with a crowdsource approaching with stimulate uh, modifications. The question is what tumors would we put in? There have been some nominations and hope to have discussions about that as well as synthetic data as well that would be generated on the basis of what we know from certain mechanisms that would both be placed in and then have errors added to that. Because remember, in all of these things, as Ludmill and others have pointed out, there's uncertainty in each of the algorithms. And having a better understanding of those uncertainties really has a tremendous importance, I think, for both the discovery and the application. And potentially convene public meetings at regular intervals for updates and modifications. And this could be part of the mutograph and the extension of mutograph with Sherlock's and whatever else hopefully f blooms, not as a thousand flowers, because these are very expensive bonsai trees that could be worth millions of dollars each, but I think there needs to be a garden of them coming together and, I, and, and, and cross cultivation per se. So my concluding threads are where we point the cameras, what are we looking to capture and how good is our resolution and understanding something like the elegance of a 250 year old bonsai tree. Working collaboratively, we have much to learn from the past and I think our women's soccer has really shown that to us. How we connect the pieces is very important and how the models to disambiguate in the way of thinking in nonlinear fashion, which is the way Marcel Proust always has written. The pieces don't always connect in an obvious way and seem to be contradictory. And Escher, that's what his art is all about. But it's telling us that we can try and make sense from a different perspective of how each of those stairs are going. But once you get to a certain point, you see, well, the reverse may be the case if you're coming from a different perspective per se. We can't forget our roots. The germline is, is, is primary. Okay, I realize I'm putting my biases on the table. But to understand the balance between the cancer processes and risk it really is the elegance of art and science together. And there's nothing better than the box art of the fugue, which I would be fine to play in the background, but I certainly can't. So let me finish there with some acknowledgments of people who have had discussions with, they've been part of why I've written what I, and said what I've said, but I'm the only one that you can attack because, you know, I've just drawn from my conversations with these individuals. And I'll finish on that and hope that you all go listen to the art of the fugue in the next few days. What a remarkable achievement, okay? Thank you.